Welcome everybody to this third session in our course, Greek History and Civilization, about 700 BC to about 500 AD. Today I want to talk about the Greeks and Persians rising tensions. The cover image is two representations of Persian soldiers. The one on the right I took in the Ashmolean Museum some years ago. The one on the left I took in the British Museum last Sunday. They both show Persian soldiers, and something worth saying about these Persian soldiers is that they're very mobile, they're not wearing armour. The one on the right is on horseback. The one on the left doesn't have a sword with him. Instead, he's carrying a bow and arrows. This is a contrast to the Greeks, who tended to fight wearing about 70 pounds weight of bronze, iron and wooden armour on them. It meant that the Persians and the Greeks were differently matched, sometimes unevenly, sometimes broadly evenly, but it depends on what you want. Greek armour was very useful for fighting on rather rocky ground in confined spaces. The Persian gear was very useful for fighting in great open plains in places like Central Asia, where mobility is everything. You chase around, firing arrows at your enemy. When you soften them up sufficiently, other people go forward and cut them to pieces. When the Persians came up against the Greeks, they tended to get the worst of it, because the Greeks generally met the Persians on ground, which was very suitable for heavy armour, that 70 pound weight of armour. But th these are relevant pictures. They are not there simply because they're pretty. They are there because they help to explain the progress of the various wars between the Greeks and the Persians. Let's begin with this. This is a war between East and West. And this is a war which the Greeks themselves conceived as a war between East and West. It is the first war of its kind of which we know. It is also the first war where we know the names. Indeed, we often know the intimate details of the lives of the participants. This is the first war of which a recognisable history has survived. It's also a war where we can look at the faces of the participants. There, in the middle of the slide, you have a representation of Darius I, Darius the Great, the great king of Persia, who first had the idea of conquering the mainland Greeks. There on the right, you have the Critian boy. I took that photograph in the Archaeological Museum. No, I didn't. I took it in the, I took it in the Acropolis Museum last October, I had some trouble taking it because the museum guards kept insisting I wasn't allowed to take photographs, but I still managed to do it. We don't know anything about the boy, but this statue was made around 500 BC. It's reasonable to suppose that he grew up into one of the men who fought at Marathon. Don't know, but I like to think that way. But, as I said, this is a war between East and West, and everybody at the time realised that this was a very important war. It's not one of those conflicts where people at the time thought, oh, another war, let's just fight it. And then afterwards they realised how important it had been, or more likely, very often wars start and everybody considers that they are the most important things that ever happened in history. And 40 years later, nobody can remember why all the bodies were produced. But this is the beginning of the histories of Herodotus, and it is a statement of a manifesto, a manifesto to which Herodotus keeps pretty closely. Here is the history written by Herodotus of Halicarnassus, so that time shall not erase what man has brought into being, and so that the great and wondrous deeds of Greeks and barbarians alike shall not be without glory and also to explain why these peoples went to war with each other. Herodotus knew from the beginning of his history that he was writing about a war of the highest significance, and he certainly rises to that occasion throughout the vast mass of his history. You then have the autobiography, in quotation marks, of King Darius I, inscribed on the outside wall of his tomb. 
You who shall hereafter see this tablet, which I have written, all these sculptures, do not destroy them, but preserve them so long as you live. If you shall behold this inscription, or these sculptures, and shall not destroy them, but shall preserve them as long as your line endures, then may Ahura Mazda be your friend, and may your family be numerous. Live long, and may Ahura Mazda make fortunate whatsoever you do. So we have the words of the participants at first hand in the case of Darius and at second hand in the case of Herodotus. We also have images of some of the people who fought in the war. Let's then begin at the beginning. After the Great Bronze Age collapse around 1200 BC, the Near East and the Mediterranean world descend into several hundred years of chaos. The mists begin to lift around 700 BC, and what you see is the growth of new empires. By about 550 BC, the dominant powers in the Near East are the Median Empire, which in due course became the Persian Empire. You then have a revival of the Babylonian Empire, which soon collapses and is taken over by the Persians, and the Kingdom of Lydia. And the Kingdom of Lydia is rather important because it is the conquest of Lydia that brought the Persians and the Greeks in direct contact with each other. And for what it's worth, you can see the Kingdom of Egypt. Egypt is always there. It never goes away. It just fades in and out of greatness every so often. So that is the... Near East, at the beginning of our period. And I said that Lydia is an important place. Lydia occupied what is now the western part of Turkey. The important king of Lydia was Croesus. He's gone into legend as a man of vast and lavish wealth. He's also the first man, I believe, known to have minted coins. But... Croesus, in the expansion of his kingdom, took over a number of Greek city-states on the coast, on what is now the western coastline of Turkey. And let me show you those. The Ionian Greeks. There's a map showing their settlements. These are settlements which were there during the Bronze Age, but they expanded considerably as the Dark Age that followed the Bronze Age began to lift. You have 12 big cities, Miletus, Ephesus, Samos and Chios and all of the others. These were large and wealthy cities. They were at least as important in the Greek world as the cities in the Greek mainland. These cities were conquered by Croesus, the king of Lydia. Croesus and the Greeks got on very well. Indeed, Croesus got on so well with the Greeks that he sent money to the Greek oracles on the mainland. He was a particular favourite with the temple of Apollo at Delphi. Now, Croesus lived next door to the rising Persian Empire, this is growing bigger and stronger with almost every day. Croesus has always been regarded as the big man in the region, but he now begins to worry about the growth of Persian might to his east. So Croesus sent to the oracle at Delphi a straightforward question. Do you think that I should take military action now against the Persians before they grow too big and too powerful? The priestess sent him back this reply. If you conquer the river Halles, you will destroy a great empire. Croesus took that at face value, called his general, said, it's all cleared, the Greek god Apollo is on our side, get your horses ready. Sadly for him, within a month of that, he was back in his capital Sardis, stuck on top of a funeral pyre being burned alive while Cyrus the Great, the king of Persia, was looking on. It had rather a happy ending. 
Cyrus decided in the end not to burn him, and when he couldn't put the fire out, Apollo brought some rain which put the fire out for them. That story may not be true, but Croesus is a real person. He turns up quite often in the history of Herodotus as a trusted advisor of Darius, of Cambyses, and of Xerxes. The significance of Croesus is that when he got into his ill-judged war with the Persians, his entire kingdom was absorbed at once into the Persian Empire, and with his kingdom, those big Greek cities and Greek settlements on the coast were absorbed into the Persian Empire. Croesus had been a very generous ruler. He had not troubled the Greeks very much for taxes. He hadn't interfered with their internal affairs. They barely knew that they were dominated by the kingdom of Lydia. The Persians weren't that bad, but they were rather more demanding than the Lydians, and for that reason the Greeks on the coast of what is now modern Turkey grew increasingly discontented within the Persian Empire, and that is the beginning of the trouble. Let's, however, go back to the Persians. Cyrus the Great, he was the first big king of Persia, and he expanded the empire until it became the largest empire that had ever existed in history, certainly the largest empire that had existed in what you might call our part of the world. His immediate successor was a man called Cambyses, who seems to have had, shall we say, mental health issues. Even so, he managed to conquer Egypt. He was then followed, or perhaps replaced, by Darius I, Darius the Great. And Darius expanded the empire still further, until by the time you get to the, this map, which is loosely dated 490 BC, you can see that the Persian Empire includes a great swathe of Western and Central Asia, all the way down to India. The Persians have also expanded across the Straits into Europe, and they have a presence on the River Danube. They also have Egypt, uh, let's not say. The Greeks are now facing the Persians directly. The Persians control the Greek cities on the Asian coast, on the coast of Western Asia. The Persians have a presence on the Danube. The Persians have, in some degree, absorbed Macedonia, which is sort of Greek. And it's obvious that the next stop in the Persian advance will be the Greek city-states in the mainland. So there is the Persian Empire. You may notice that when I read the first sentence of the history of Herodotus to you, he called the Persians barbarians. We tend to think of barbarians as rather violent, unpleasant people, best avoided. For the Greeks, it was simply a technical description of non-Greeks. The Greeks were never very good at learning foreign languages, and whenever they heard foreign peoples talking, it always sounded to them as if the foreigners were repeating the words bar, bar, bar. Therefore, they called foreigners barbarians. It does not contain any value judgment. Herodotus is a notably fair and impartial historian, and he was not the only fair and impartial Greek when it came to looking at the Persians. The Greeks accepted that the Persians were civilised, they could get on quite well with the Persians on occasion, and they were perfectly willing to say perfectly decent things about the Persians. Let's have a look at some of the things that Herodotus says about the Persians in Book One of his history. They very much enjoy wine drinking, and it is not permitted to a man to vomit or to make water in presence of another. They are wont to deliberate when drinking hard about the most important of their affairs, and whatever conclusion has pleased them, this on the next day when they are sober, the master of the house where they happen to deliberate lays open before them for discussion. If it pleases them when they are sober also, they adopt it, but if it does not please them, they let it go. I could extend on that. 
The Persians were a hard drinking lot, and quite often the king of Persia, after dinner when he was very, very drunk, might pass a sentence of death. But under Persian law, or perhaps I should say under binding Persian custom, the death penalty could not be carried out until the next morning when the king was sober. He was then reminded of this death sentence, and he could revoke it or confirm it. Herodotus also says, The Persians, more than any other men, admit foreign usages, for they both wear the median dress, judging it to be more comely than their own, and also for fighting they wear the Egyptian corslet. Moreover, they adopt all kinds of luxuries when they hear of them, and in particular they have learned from the Greeks to have sex with boys. Everyone marries several lawful wives, and they get a much larger number of concubines. It is established as a sign of manly excellence, next after excellence in fight, to be able to show many sons, and to those who have most the king sends gifts every year, because they consider big numbers to be a source of strength, and they educate their children, beginning at five years old and going to on till twenty, in three things only, in riding, in shooting, and in speaking the truth. There's then the explanation of this rather gory image on the right. Otani's father, Sisamnes, had been one of the royal judges, and Cambyses had cut his throat and flayed off all his skin because he had been bribed to give an unjust judgment. Then he cut leather strips of the skin which had been torn away, and these he covered the seat upon which Sisamnes had sat to give judgment, the idea is that the replacement of this corrupt judge would sit on a chair covered in the flayed skin of his predecessor, which might remind him of the consequences of giving unjust judgments. So that's how the Persians looked on the Persians. They looked on them as foreigners. They looked down on them, in the sense that the Greeks looked down on everyone who wasn't a Greek. But they did have a rough admiration for the Persians. They didn't regard them as savages. They regarded them as foreigners, uh, foreigners with whom you might get on rather well or with whom you might go to war, depending on circumstances. Sadly for the Greeks and Persians, all the circumstances of the age were directing them to a large-scale war that would continue for many years. Let's come back to the Ionian Greeks. The Persians took over those coastal city-states by default. They didn't set about conquering them. These had already been conquered by Croesus, the king of Lydia, and when the Persians conquered Lydia, they took over the Greek city-states. They largely continued the same devolved administration of the Greek cities the problem for the Persians was that they didn't know how to give the Greeks a devolved administration. The normal Persian practice when they conquered a new territory was to go to the established rulers of that territory and say, you're now my man, you will rule this territory for me. Nothing will change, you rule your people according to your own customs, we don't want you to adopt our language, we certainly don't want you to adopt our general ways, no. You can carry on as before, you're in charge, we will back you up if your people decide they don't like you, and you will make sure that you rule your people in conformity with our interests. And generally, this made for very peaceful relations in the Persian Empire. The Persian difficulty when it came to the Greeks was that these Greek city-states did not have recognisable ruling classes. They were democracies or they were semi-democratic. There was no one local big man with whom the Persians could very easily do business. And they didn't really know how to keep these Greeks under control. They were always arguing, quite often they'd fight each other, and there were no agreed rulers, there was no established ruling class. The Persian solution in the end was to intervene directly in the domestic affairs of these Greek cities and to impose a local Greek on them. This man is now your master. 
I, you didn't vote for him, you don't like him, but mm -hmm. we've decided that he's your master, and so you will obey him, and he will obey us. This led to a lot of discontent in those Greek cities. They felt a permanent sense of humiliation at being subordinated to the Persians. They felt Persian rule, light though it was, much more heavily than other subject peoples did. The Egyptians, for example, mostly didn't even notice that they were ruled by a foreigner. As the Persians moved further west into Europe, the Greek cities in the south, Athens, Corinth, and of course the Spartans, who can't be called a city-state, but the Greeks in the south, the independent Greeks, the free Greeks you might call them, became increasingly worried about the future progress of their relationships with the Persians. They knew that the Persians were interested in further expansion into Europe. They realized that they were on the front line, and so they began to grow rather paranoid about the Persians. So you have discontent in those cities which are directly ruled by the Persians, and you have a rising fear, a rising sense of paranoia among the free Greeks about Persian intentions. This is not to say, however, that the Persians universally behaved badly towards the Greeks. The Persians do appear to have accepted that the Greeks were special among their subject peoples. Indeed, I've read that little piece from Herodotus saying that the Persians were open to influence from the people they conquered. If you look at these Persian coins, you can see at once that the Persians have in the artistic sense, to some degree, being captured already by the Greeks. The Persian capitals, and there were several of them, the Persian capitals were filled with Greeks, Greek doctors, Greek engineers, Greek writers, Greeks of all kinds, all performing various services and being well rewarded by the Persians. There is some reason to believe that the Persian authorities mm -hmm generally spoke Greek in the areas where there were large Greek settlements. It's even possible that Xerxes himself, the great king Xerxes, was fluent in Greek. If you read about interactions between Xerxes and his Greek advisers and the Greek refugees in his court, you never hear any reference to interpreters. Herodotus does talk about interpreters, Sometimes when he's telling a story about an interaction between the king of Persia and some of his other subjects, he mentions interpreters. But whenever he discusses interactions between the Greeks and the Persians, between Xerxes and the Greeks, he never mentions any interpreters. And there is very good reason to believe that from an early period, the Persians, in some degree, became cultural satellites of their Greek subjects. It is most unusual for the great king of Persia to learn the language of one of the subject nationalities, but I'll say again, there is some reason, and I think it's good reason, to believe that Xerxes at least was fluent in Greek, and there's good reason to believe that about 150 years later, when there was another significant interaction between the Greeks and Persians, the Persian rulers, on the whole, were fluent in Greek. There were friendly relations between Greeks and Persians throughout. As I said, the Persian capitals were filled with Greeks, and it was normal, entirely accepted, it was almost without comment, that if you came off worst in a conflict in your home city, if you did badly in politics or if you lost a civil war in your home Greek state, you would take yourself off to Persia and get yourself accepted as a refugee. Greeks and Persians mixed together on very friendly terms, sexual relationships, political intrigues. The Greeks took part in various court intrigues in Persia. Nobody seems to have resented their presence or their interference. 
as I said, you can see that these Persian coins do show an increasing capture by Greek styles. But even though the Persians regarded the Greeks as special among the subject nationalities, that did not mean that their Greek subjects liked being ruled by the Persians. They didn't like it. It was humiliating, it was irksome, and they wanted one way or another to get rid of the Persians. Rather difficult when you consider that although large and wealthy in their own terms, these Greek city-states on the western coast of Asia were very small things compared with the vastness of the Persian Empire, an empire so vast that it could take six months to cross from one side to the other. Even so, the Greeks were not put off by the vast bulk of the Persian Empire. They still wanted to be rid of the Persians one way or another. But let me come back to the Persian ideas, the Persian ambition to expand through Europe. Rather than tell you this story at the moment, let me find a map. There we are. Here is a map showing the island of Samos. I'm moving my cursor around it. Can you see that? It's quite a large island. It's just off the coast of Western Asia. You can stand on the coast and look across and you can see the coast of the Persian Empire. This was ruled by a man called Polycrates. Polycrates was a most efficient and a very powerful ruler of Samos. Under his rule, Samos was a significant trading and naval power in the Aegean, and he had no fear of the Persians. The story told in Herodotus, however, suggests that not all will be well for him. The story told in Herodotus is this. Polycrates had a correspondence friendship with the king of Egypt. And the king of Egypt grew rather alarmed that everything Polycrates did was an outstanding success. He apparently wrote to Polycrates one day saying, I see the reports of your success in every endeavour and I fear for you because the gods are jealous of human prosperity. In order to avert the jealousy of the gods, my advice is that you should take the most precious thing you own and cast it into the deepest sea so that it can never be recovered. By doing that, you will break your run of success and the gods may not notice you and then they will not destroy you utterly. Advised by the king of Egypt, Polycrates took a very large and precious ring sailed out into the Aegean, dropped it over the side of his ship, and then sailed back to Samos. A few days later, a fisherman came to the palace saying, look, I've caught this big and wonderful fish. I would like to present this as a gift to our ruler Polycrates. And the story goes on further that when Polycrates opened the fish at the dining table, there was his ring in the belly of the fish. And this told Polycrates that the gods had noticed what he was doing and he was on their list of people to destroy. And so he fell into despair. A while later, he was invited to the mainland for discussions with the Persian rulers. But this was a ruse. The Persians took hold of Polycrates, crucified him, and then in the resulting chaos, they hopped across the mile or so of water and took over Samos. The significance of this in strategic terms is that the Persians were spreading across the Aegean Sea. They had taken the large and strategically useful island of Samos just off their own coast. It took any prospect of a Greek naval threat to Western Asia away from them. It also allowed them to project force directly into the central Aegean. You can believe or disbelieve the story of Polycrates and the ring, though it's a very fine story, but there's no doubt that the Persians had their eye on Samos and they took Samos 
And from now on, Samos was no longer a Greek outpost in the Aegean. It was a forward post for the Persians in their endeavours to take over the whole of the Aegean world. Here again is the Persian Empire at its greatest extent, and it is useful to remind yourselves every so often how big the Persian Empire was. It was, as I have said, the biggest empire that had ever existed. And it was, on the whole, rather well ruled. The Persians didn't take very much in taxes, they didn't demand very much of their subject peoples, they very largely left them alone. Probably most of their subject peoples didn't even know that they were subjects of the Persians. But it's a large empire, very powerful, and anyone who is thinking of a war with Persia needs to look at the correlation of forces, which are apparently entirely on the side of Persia. Let's now have a look at the Ionian Revolt, and I will summarise the details of this. It's a long and involved story. In the year 500, Aristagoras, who was the Greek frontman in Miletus for the Persians, he decided to strengthen his position with the people of Miletus by conquering the island of Naxos, which you can see on this map in the middle of the Aegean with that red circle around it. As I've said, the front men put up by the Persians to rule these Greek cities were never popular with the Greeks in those cities, but Aristagoras thought that if he were to oversee the conquest of Naxos, this would bolster his position among the people of Miletus. However, he didn't have the resources to undertake this invasion all by himself, so he asked the local Persian governor, a brother of King Darius I, a man called Artaphernes, to join in the conquest. This would be a joint venture between the Greeks and the Persians for the conquest of Naxos, and they would share equally in the loot and the glory all that Artaphernes, the Persian strongman in Sardis, had to do was to hand over a very large loan and to help in the collection of ships. The invasion of Naxos was a total failure. And as always happens when these joint ventures don't go according to plan, the two different projectors soon fell out and began blaming each other. But you see, Artaphernes in Sardis, the brother of Darius I, was demanding repayment of the very substantial loan he had made to the Greek frontman in Miletus, Aristagoras. Aristagoras couldn't repay the Persian loan. He found that his only option was to declare independence from Persia. Instead of going among his own people with an armed guard, reading out new laws sent down from the Persians, he suddenly remade himself as a democratic leader of the people of Miletus, and he sent letters to all the other Greek cities along the coast of Western Asia, inviting them to join in a great revolt which would throw off Persian rule. The revolt spread all the way through those western parts of the Persian Empire. All the Greek areas along the western coast of what is now Turkey rose in revolt against the Persians. The Persians were caught off guard. It was a large empire. They were always fighting wars on the borders, wars of conquest or wars of defence. And there was not much they could do about this sudden, this completely unexpected revolt of the Ionian Greeks. But again, if you think of that map of the Persian Empire, the correlation of forces is somewhat against the Ionian Greeks. Aristagoras knew that if this revolt had any prospect of success, then the Ionian Greeks would need help from outside, and the only places where they could look for help 
were the Greek cities and the Greek states across the Aegean. So Aristagoras got into a ship, sailed out from Miletus across the Aegean on a mission of diplomatic outreach. In 499, Aristagoras arrived in Sparta to seek help. Oh, and I think the most important part of this slide is that image on the right, another photograph I took some time ago. This shows a Greek soldier getting into his armour, and you can see how involved and heavy this armour is. But I'll leave that with you. Aristagoras went first to the Spartans, and he didn't need to speak to many people. He needed to speak to the two kings of Sparta. He needed to speak to the Gerousia, the committee of old men who assisted the kings in governing Sparta. And he made a long speech to the Spartans saying, we have thrown off the barbarian oppressors who've ruled us for so long. Will you come and help us? And if you do help us, you will gain much booty and much glory. You will gain, indeed, an undying name. There are many things you can say about the Spartans, but I don't think you can ever say that they were particularly generous or particularly trusting. They looked at Aristagoras, and one of them asked, So, if we were to get involved in this war, and if we were to do particularly well in this war, how far away is the Persian capital? Let's suppose, for example, that we wanted to take the Persian capital. How far inland is this? Aristagoras told them that, well, it's a three-month journey inland to get to Persepolis. The Spartans gave him a most unpleasant look and said that he should go elsewhere in his search for allies, they were completely unwilling to send an army out of Sparta, especially to send an army out of Sparta that would then need to march three months inland before they could take the capital of the enemy. So Aristagoras, having got absolutely nothing from the Spartans, and it's not the first time or the last time that people got absolutely nothing out of the Spartans, he took himself off to Athens... The Athenians had rather a complex relationship with Persia. As I've said, if you did badly in some political contest in your home state and you found that your home city was no longer a very friendly place to live, you could take yourself off and become a refugee living in the court of the great king of Persia. In 509 BC, the Athenians had thrown off the rule of a family of tyrants and they had moved very quickly towards an early form of their democracy. The exiled tyrant of Athens, a man called Hippias, went off at once to the Persians and asked for help. The Athenians then turned up and said, oh, don't help this man we're quite willing to swear a loose kind of fealty to you. The Persians said, oh, that's nice, OK, we accept your fealty. When the ambassadors got back to Athens, the whole proceeding was disowned by the assembly. And so the Athenians have a rather ambiguous relationship with the Persians, to put it mildly. When Aristagoras turned up in Athens, he was allowed to make a speech before the assembly, he didn't find himself faced by some very hard-faced old men asking pointed questions about the size and power of the enemy. Instead, he faced maybe eight or nine or ten thousand Athenians in the marketplace, and he made a long and flowery speech saying, oh, these Persians, they don't wear armour like we do, they, they're soft like women. They'll take one good look at you in your armour and they'll turn and run and just think of the wealth they'll leave behind that you can scoop up. I do tell you, join with my rebellion and you will have to weigh the money that you get. You won't be able to count it. The Athenians accepted this and they promised to send naval and military help across the Aegean to the Ionians to assist in their revolt. 
here's a nice picture. I couldn't find a decent image, so I had to generate one using my artificial intelligence engine. This is the presentation of earth and water to the great king of Persia. If he wanted to conquer a territory, he wouldn't march straight in. No, he would send ambassadors and he'd invite the rulers of the territory to present gifts of earth and water to the great king. They're symbols of subjection. O oh, great King Darius, please accept this gift of earth from our country and of water from our country. From now on, you are our great master. The King of Persia would raise a hand and smile and say, I don't regard myself as your ruler, more as your friend. You get the idea. Darius was under the impression that the Athenians had given him a gift of earth and water. But never mind that. The next thing he heard about the Athenians, they were helping with these revolted Ionian city-states. The Athenians turned up in Asia Minor. They turned up on the eastern shores of the Aegean Sea. They joined with the Milesians and with the armies of the other Ionian cities, and they marched inland. The provincial capital, the Persian provincial capital, was Sardis, the former capital of Lydia, where Croesus had been the king. The idea was that the Greeks would take this provincial capital and hold it. However, Sardis at this time was filled with houses and other buildings, not made from stone, not made from brick but from a kind of wattle and daub, dried reeds in mud. The Persian garrison retreated to the high point of the city, and the Greeks took the lower part. While the Greeks were looting Sardis, a fire broke out, and it was a hot summer, and, well, the whole of Sardis went up like a box of matches. The Persians now came down, out of their garrison and defeated the Greeks and sent them smartly packing back towards the coast. A very serious thing to have done. Darius was willing to allow his Greek subjects to have their little revolt. He would deal with them in due course. He might punish them harshly or he might punish them very gently. But they were his subjects, they were in revolt, and he would do something about them. He now heard that his provincial capital had been taken and burned to the ground. He was outraged because this was a provincial capital. It's a matter of prestige. The Persians did not have an enormous army to control this enormous empire, Persian dominion largely rested on prestige, as indeed all imperial power does ultimately, and he didn't want word to get around that one of his provincial capitals had been taken, not only by his own subjects, but by a foreign power and burned, and burned with impunity. He was outraged when he heard about the burning of Sardis. He demanded to know who these Athenians were. He went out and shot an arrow in the air, saying, O oh Zeus, grant me vengeance on the Athenians. And then every day for the rest of his life, before he had dinner, one of his slaves would lean forward and tell him, O oh master, remember the Athenians who humiliated you by burning Sardis. Darius wasn't quite sure who the Athenians were when he first heard the news that they'd burned Sardis. After that, he made sure to know a great deal about the Athenians, and he decided that he would punish them. He would punish them with the greatest harshness imaginable. The Iona revolt went on for seven years, very hard fighting, but eventually the Persians were able to settle their troubles elsewhere in the empire and to assemble an overpoweringly large army which went in and put down the Ionian revolt. 
The Persians burned Miletus, but apart from that, there were no serious reprisals. Artaphernes, the brother of Darius, was sent back as the provincial governor or as the satrap, and he actually reduced the taxes payable by the Ionian cities. The idea was that the Greeks would not be rounded up and crucified. They wouldn't have all their men crucified and their women taken off into slavery. No, the Persians would be reasonable. They would sit down with the Greeks and say, now, we don't want any more of this nonsense. We do accept that you are not entirely satisfied with our rule, and we don't claim that we were ever perfect. And I think what we should do is put all of this unpleasantness behind us. Indeed, it went rather further than that. The Persians reduced the tax burden on their Greek subjects, and then the son-in-law of Darius, a man called Mardonius, of whom we'll hear a great deal more over the next few weeks, he was sent out from Persepolis, the main capital. He visited Ionia, and he abolished the entire system by which the Persians had previously ruled the Greek areas. Instead of putting up Greek frontmen as local tyrants, Mardonius allowed the Greeks home rule. He established modified democratic systems in the Greek city-states on the western coast of Asia, and he said to them, look, you can't have total independence, but you can have home rule. You can have your assemblies, you can have your turbulent discussions. We won't keep asking, so who is in charge, because we accept that the people in charge in your cities are a shifting caste of people of whom we haven't heard. So the Persians responded to the Ionian revolt by lowering the tax burden on their Greek subjects and then by allowing them a very large degree of home rule or domestic autonomy. The revolt had been a serious embarrassment to the Persians because if you have a successful revolt anywhere in a large empire, it will inspire other people who may have a grudge against the imperial power to try their luck. The Persians wanted to make sure that the Greeks would not revolt again. If the Persians had responded to the revolt by wholesale massacres, burnings of cities, leading off of tens of thousands into slavery, you still have a large number of Greeks remaining and they will just have a further grudge and ten years later when the Persians were off fighting on the borders of India the Greeks might try the luck again so they tried to conciliate the Greeks and for the most part this was rather successful there was no more trouble from the Ionian city-states at least not for the moment but although Darius was willing to conciliate his own Greek subjects, he was still very angry with those Greeks from the mainland who had taken part in the revolt, who had sent assistance. He was also generally troubled by the way in which the Greeks conducted themselves. Again, if you are ruling a large empire, something you do not want is neighbours who are always going to war with each other and sometimes going to war with you. You do not want instability on any of your frontiers. And if you have an empire that is directly next door to mainland Greece, you have permanent large-scale chaos on your borders because, as I said a few weeks ago, there was no such place as Greece. Greece was a purely geographical expression. Greece was divided into dozens or hundreds of small city-states, most of them fiercely independent and quite willing to go to war with each other uh, for the most trifling of reasons. So as a long-term matter of strategy, the Persian kings wanted to take over the Greek mainland and stop them from fighting each other. Indeed, that's one reason why the Romans eventually took over Greece. They, they were tired of these endless disputes between their neighbours, and the only way to stop those disputes was to 
conquer them and then flatten them. So Darius was angry with the Athenians and the Eritreans and the various other Greek city-states which had sent assistance to this revolt. That was the local reason, but the longer-term reason was that the Persians wanted to conquer the Greeks, partly because it was a further expansion of their empire, but also because it shut down a great deal of irritating instability on their western frontier. The first thing Darius did, once the Ionian revolt was settled, was to send messengers to all the Greek cities, all the Greek cities as yet outside his empire, asking for a gift of earth and water. I won't show the image again, but you get the idea what Darius was seeking. Most of the Greek city-states took one look at the Persian ambassadors and gave in. They sent immediate gifts of earth and water because, although you may not like the Persians, facts are facts, and there is no way that you can stand up to a Persian attack. The Persians will probably not demand that much more from you, at least not, not for the moment. So you send them the gift of earth and water. The Athenians, however, refused the request, and so did the Spartans. And here is an image. It's another artificial intelligence-generated image because I couldn't find one on the internet. What the Athenians did was to take hold of the Persian ambassadors and to throw them down a hole in the ground, telling them, you want earth, you dig it out yourself. And if you want water... Well, they hitched up their tunics and urinated on the Persian ambassadors. Then they killed them. Mm. The Spartans did something similar. Darius, I've used the word outrage several times, but Darius was even more outraged. Not only were these Greeks giving material assistance to his own subjects in their revolts against him, but they were breaking all the normal rules of diplomatic nicety and murdering his ambassadors. So that was it. Darius decided that he would punish the Athenians and he would then punish the Spartans in due course. In 490, Darius assembled a small but very substantial invasion force. He put it under the control of Datis and Artaphernes, and this is the son of the satrap of Sardis. It is the nephew of Darius. He gave them a small but substantial army and navy and told them, go and sort out the Athenians and anybody else who has behaved so shamefully to our ambassadors. Oh, and there is a larger representation of this murder of the Persian ambassadors. Rather fanciful, but then if I'd used an oil painting, it would be no less fanciful. Here is the line of approach of the first Persian attack on Greece. The Persian fleet set out from Samos, that's the island that had been ruled by Polycrates, Remember I said that under Polycrates, Samos had been the forward position of the Greeks in the Aegean. It was a substantial naval power and to some degree shielded Greece from a Persian attack. Once Polycrates was out of the way, Samos became a forward base for the Persians. So the invasion force set out from Samos, it sailed off to Naxos, which had eventually been reduced by the Persians. From Naxos, the fleet turned north. It went to Delos, the birthplace of Apollo and Artemis. And then from Delos, it swung straight across the Aegean all the way up to the city of Eritrea. Not a very large or important city, but it, was, it had, along with the Athenians and several other of the Greek cities, given material assistance to the Greek revolt in Ionia. The Persians landed at Eritrea, they took the city, they burned it, they led away the surviving inhabitants into slavery, 
And this being done, the Persian invasion force turned south. The next stop was Athens. They would take Athens and they would burn it and they would lead the survivors away into slavery. And by doing this, Darius would make it absolutely plain to all of the mainland Greeks that those gifts of earth and water had better be forthcoming very quickly because the Persians had now put the whole of mainland Greece in their target sites. The Athenians were frightened, and who wouldn't be frightened? You have the Persian Empire coming for you, and Athens was not a very large city. The city of Athens itself had a population of about 30,000 people, and the whole extended territory around Athens had a population of maybe a quarter of a million. The Persian Empire may have had a population of 30, 40, 50 million we don't know exactly, but it was a very large population. It's certainly a very large land mass. So the Athenians looked around for allies. The most obvious ally that they should seek is Sparta. The Spartans have also refused to give earth and water to Darius, and Sparta will surely be the next stop on this tour of Greece, this military tour of Greece. The Athenians sent a messenger running all the way from Athens to Sparta. Greek roads have never been very good. Even the modern motorways mean that you drive for hours and hours to get to somewhere that would take about half an hour in England. And they sent a young man called Phaedipides, and I'll tell you more about him in a moment. Phaedipides ran all the way from Athens to Sparta to ask the Spartans, indeed to tell the Spartans, the Persians are in Greece. Will you send an army to help in the defence of Athens? The Spartans thought about it and said, we would really love to give the fullest possible assistance to our good friends, the Athenians. However, we have Oh yes, we have a religious festival, and I'm afraid that we couldn't possibly send an army until the end of the festival, which will be uh, next month or perhaps sometime later. So you're in our thoughts. Best of luck, but the gods just don't allow us to send an army to help you at the moment. But any other time, if you need help, you know where to come. So Phaedipides ran back to Athens and gave them the bad news. At about the same time, news came to the Athenians that the Persians were heading towards the Bay of Marathon. And if you look on this map, you'll see where the last of those red arrows points west. That's the Bay of Marathon. The Persians were going to land there, get their horses ashore, and then set out south towards Athens. And there was no Athenian army that was capable of standing up to even quite a small Persian army. At least that's what the Athenians thought. So what is to be done? Yes, what is to be done? Now, a number of things. The first is, here is a representation of Greek and Persian soldiers. As I've said, the Persians fought on horseback. Their soldiers were very lightly armoured, no plate armour, no chain mail. It was mostly quilted jackets, which would, they would withstand arrows from quite a distance. These mounted soldiers would dart all over the place, firing arrows, softening up an army, killing it at a distance. The Greek idea of fighting was that a man should put on about 70 pounds weight of bronze, wooden, and iron armour. He would march forward, rather like a modern tank. Very difficult to kill him, but running about in that kind of equipment was not an option. And if you have a battle between Greeks and Persians on flat land, where horses can easily dart around, the Greeks will be at a disadvantage. Not a fatal disadvantage, when Greeks and Persians had met in battle during the Ionian Revolt, the Persians had realised that they were at a disadvantage. The Greeks had better discipline 
and better weapons than they had. They had better think again about their general military strategy. But one of the advantages of the Greeks was the 70 pounds weight of armour. If and a Greek army runs at you in that stuff, it is rather like being hit with a tank attack. The Athenians knew that they were numerically inferior to the Persians, so their strategy was to send the largest army they could put together to Marathon and to attack the Persians as they landed. Whenever an invasion force is landing, it is at a disadvantage, and the Persian disadvantage was that they would send the men ashore first, and then the horses would need to be disembarked, and there would be a degree of chaos on the beach until the Persians were ready to move inland. The Athenians took advantage of that, and here is a moving GIF image which represents the Greek strategy. I'll let that run through and then I'll explain what the strategy was. As the Persians were lining up on the beach, the entirety of the Athenian army would run down the beach, picking up speed as they went. It's rather a steep beach, I'm told. I've never been there, but I'm told it is rather steep. The Greeks would run down the beach in full armour. They would hit the Persians when they were least expecting it, when they were most unprepared. And this is exactly what the Athenians did. They rumbled down that beach like a tank attack. They crashed into the Persians. They then allowed their centre to retreat slightly, which only allowed the Athenians to wheel round and to destroy the Persian army as it was still assembling on the beach. The Persians got straight back into their ships and sailed away. They had no bases in Greece, and they now found that the entire Greek coastline was closed to them, so they had to sail back across the Aegean and tell the great king of Persia that the invasion had been a failure. Darius accepted this with good grace, but said that he'd be back. He would think again about the matter of invading Greece. Next time, he would do it with much larger forces, and it would be a much more successful operation. There's an artificial intelligence representation of the Greek attack at Marathon, and that's probably rather what it was like. They raced down the beach and chased the Persians away from Greece. It was completely unexpected. Most people had expected that once the Persians turned up, they would destroy the Athenian defence, and they would then take Athens and burn it, and the Greeks would all have to think very seriously about how to respond to those Persian requests for earth and water. Instead, the Athenians inflicted a signal defeat on the Persians. A little while later... A small Spartan army turned up. They had changed their mind and they'd sent a small army north to see what was happening. The Spartans got to Marathon. They looked at the piles of rotting Persian bodies, told the Athenians, hmm, that's not bad, and went home again. And here is the story of Pheidippides, which is in Herodotus. A young man... He was a famed runner, he was a famous athlete, and he was sent to take the news of the Persian arrival from Athens to Sparta. He ran all the way from Athens to Sparta. When the Spartans said, sorry, we'd like to help, but we can't at the moment, religious reasons, you see, he ran back to Athens and told them the bad news. He then ran all the way from Athens to Marathon. He fought in the Battle of Marathon, and then he ran back from Marathon to Athens, arriving in the marketplace, as shown in this rather fanciful AI image, announced, rejoice, we conquer, and promptly fell down dead. Not surprising, if you run around in Greece with very few clothes on in the hottest months of the summer, and you don't pay too much attention to hydration, 
you, you may well fall down dead if you run too much, won't you? But that's the story. There's another story that on one of his running missions, he bumped into the god Pan. But, well, you can believe that or reject it as you please. The Athenians were astonished. It was unexpectedly good news. Not only had the Athenians held the Persians up at Marathon, they had inflicted a complete defeat on the Persians at Marathon, and Athens was now safe. But it was only safe for the moment. Everybody knew that this was a temporary reprieve. The Persians, or Darius, was unlikely to nod when the news came in that his invasion had failed and say, oh, well, we won't trouble the Greeks again. What we might do is invade further north of the Danube. Richard Pickings there, you see. They knew that Darius would not give up on the Greeks. Darius would be back. Nobody expected that it would be 10 years though the next 10 years were used to very good effect by the Athenians, no one expected that it would take the Persians another 10 years before they assembled another invasion force. But everybody knew that sooner or later the Persians would be back. It wasn't a question of if, it was a question of when. And so the Athenians and their rather small number of allies in Greece knew that they had to pull themselves together and find a way of stopping another Persian invasion. That's all I have to say about this. Although there's probably a great deal more that I could say, but I think that gives you an overview. So if I could summarize, the Persians took over those coastal cities in Western Asia by default when they conquered the kingdom of Lydia. The Greeks did not like being ruled by the Persians, and at last they broke out in revolt. These revolted Greek cities then asked for help from the mainland, and they received help, most notably from the Athenians. The revolt was a failure. The Persians treated their revolted Greek subjects with singular leniency but they were very angry with the Athenians and those other Greek states which had given help to the rebellion. Their plan was to inflict a crushing punishment on the Athenians as a prelude to an invasion of Greece, and they wanted to invade Greece partly because they believed that it was their imperial mission to conquer the world, but also because the Greeks were a turbulent profoundly unstable set of neighbours, and as I've said, no great empire wants to have turbulent neighbours on its frontiers. So the Persians assembled what they considered to be an adequate force for sending into Greece and inflicting the punishment they intended on the Athenians and various other Greek states. The Persians then suffered an unexpected but crushing reverse at Marathon, and for various reasons to do with provisioning, they had to go all the way back across the Aegean. They had to vacate the Greek mainland. But Darius announced that he would be back. He would assemble the largest invasion force in history, and this time there would not be a repeat of Marathon. The Greeks knew that this would happen and began to prepare for it. Nobody expected it would take 10 years because at this time there was a sudden rebellion in Egypt. The Egyptians didn't much like being ruled by foreigners. They seemed to have taken advantage of the Persian preoccupation with Greece and they threw off Persian rule. Recovering Egypt was much more important to Darius than continuing an attack on Greece. So the Greek invasion was put on hold while Darius led an army in person into Egypt. There was then a further revolt in Babylon, and Darius found himself fighting a war to reduce that rebellion. 
During this war, Darius died. He died of some infection. The Persian Empire did not fall immediately into chaos, but the son of Darius, Xerxes, found that he had about seven or eight years of hard fighting in both Egypt and Babylonia, and there was no time for giving serious thought to an invasion of Greece. But eventually, the Persians put down those revolts in Egypt and Babylonia, Xerxes was now securely the great king of Persia, and it would soon be time to dust off those invasion plans so that the Persians would be back in Greece, this time in numbers so overwhelming that the Greeks would crumble. They would surrender at the first sound of the Persian armies. So that's what I've spoken about today. Any questions or any comments, anybody?